try and suggest three approaches to the doctrine of the Trinity, which might help us to understand why the Trinity is indeed the heart of our life. The first approach I want to use considers the total structure of salvation history. Then secondly, let us look at the five central events recounted in the New Testament. And then thirdly, let us look at the worshipping practice of the Church, what is known as the Lex Orandi, the Law of Prayer. Look then first at the total trajectory of salvation history. We see there three developing stages. And these are described by St. Gregory the Theologian in a celebrated passage from his fifth theological oration. During the first stage, says Gregory, the Old Testament proclaimed the Father plainly, but the Son only in a more obscure fashion. That is to say, in the Old Testament, the Son is proclaimed through types, through prophecy. At the second stage, continues Gregory, the Gospels revealed the Son openly and explicitly, but they did no more than hint at the Godhead of the Spirit. At the third and final stage, inaugurated on the day of Pentecost, Gregory goes on, the Spirit now dwells among us, manifesting uh, himself to us in a clearer way. So St. Gregory concludes, you see illuminations breaking upon us successively, while the order of theology, which it is better for us to observe, prevents us both from proclaiming everything at once and from keeping it hidden to the end. In this way, by progressive additions, we advance from glory to glory. Now, of course, in saying this, St. Gregory does not mean that the Son and the Spirit were not active in the period of the Old Testament. He does not mean that the Spirit was not active during the life of Christ. All three persons of the Trinity are active together from the very beginning of creation. What St. Gregory is describing is a gradual development not in presence or activity but in revelation. The first stage of revelation, the Old Testament, is above all the epoch of God the Father. The Jews believed in one God. They were waiting for a Messiah, but they did not have any clear idea that when this Messiah came, he would in fact be God himself. They were expecting a human leader. Then we come to the period of the Gospels. Christ is clearly present as God. And yet it is clear in the Gospels that Christ is not the same as God the Father. Christ addresses God the Father in prayer, speaking to the Father as one person to another person. At first, of course, the disciples imagine that Jesus is just a human teacher. They call him rabbi. But 
gradually they realize he is more than human, until the moment comes after the resurrection when St. Thomas says explicitly to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So there we have a second stage where God is revealed not just as Father, but as Father and Son. And then comes the third stage, initiated on the day of Pentecost, continuing up to our own time and onwards until the second coming. And this St. Gregory sees as above all the era of the Holy Spirit. The age of the Church is the age of the Spirit revealed to us. The Spirit was present, yes, from the very beginning. In the Genesis account of creation it is said that the Spirit of God brooded over the waters. In the Psalms it is said, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. That is Psalm 33 or 32 in the Orthodox numbering. So, yes, the Son and the Spirit, the Word and the breath of God, they are present from creation. And, of course, the Spirit is present in the life of Christ, overshadowing Christ at the Annunciation, descending upon him at the Baptism. But it is only at Pentecost and in the life of the Church that follows on from Pentecost that the Spirit is revealed in a more explicit and direct way, as a person, not just an impersonal force, a sacred blast, as I once heard him described, but as a person who dwells among us persons in a fully personal way. So this is what uh, St. Gregory is wishing to impress upon us. A gradual unfolding in the self-revelation of God. A gradual development in his disclosure that comes in three great stages. The Old Testament, the life of Christ, and the era of the Church. So that's one way of thinking about the Trinity and its progressive revelation. Under the Old Covenant, it's primarily the Father who is revealed. In the Gospels, God is proclaimed as Son as well as Father. At Pentecost, and in the dramatic expansion of the Apostolic Church, the Paraclete Spirit, proceeding from the Father, sent to us by the Son, is plainly made manifest as the third person of the Godhead. Now a second possible way of approach to the doctrine of the Trinity. Let us think of the story of Christ's life on earth as recounted to us in the New Testament. The story of his incarnation, death and resurrection, and then the sending of the Spirit at Pentecost. These five central moments in the story of the New Testament are found to possess a threefold Trinitarian character. The word Trinity doesn't itself occur anywhere in the New Testament, but there is within the New Testament a clearly articulated Trinitarian structure. So the reality of the Trinity is present everywhere in the New Testament, even if the word is not there. Think first of the Incarnation. The Father sends down the Spirit upon the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that she conceives and bears the Son. Father, Spirit, 
Tsa. That's the pattern at the Annunciation. Then think of the baptism of Christ. The Father speaks from heaven, bearing witness to the Son. This is my beloved Son. And then the Spirit, in the form of a dove, descends from the Father and rests upon the Son. Father, Son, Spirit. In the whole of the Gospel story, the Trinitarian character of God is most clearly revealed at this moment, the baptism. Then, thirdly, think of the Transfiguration. This also is Trinitarian, though less obviously so. If we look closely at the Transfiguration, we notice a parallel with the Baptism. As at the Baptism, the Father speaks from heaven testifying to the Son. This is my beloved Son. And then the Spirit descends upon the Son, on this occasion not in the form of a dove, but as a cloud of light. Now, in the Gospels it isn't said that the cloud of light is in fact the presence of the Holy Spirit. But this is the way the Transfiguration has been understood in the Christian community from the 2nd and 3rd century onwards. And certainly in the hymns of the Orthodox Church, clearly the cloud of light is identified with the Holy Spirit. So there again, at the Transfiguration, as at the Baptism, we have Father, Son and Spirit. What about, in the fourth place, the cross and the resurrection? If we look at the cross in isolation, it might be rather difficult for us to be sure how the Spirit is active here. But, of course, Father and Son are active because, during the crucifixion, more than once, our Lord Jesus addresses his Father. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And then he commends his self into the hands of the Father as he dies. But what about the Spirit? Well, let us not take the cross on its own, but let us treat the cross and the resurrection as a single event. Now, if we look at cross and resurrection together, then clearly the Spirit is present, for, as St. Paul says at the beginning of the Epistle to the Romans, God the Father raises the Son in and through the power of the Spirit. The resurrection is a Spirit-filled event. And so we again see the Trinity at work in this single drama, this undivided happening of the cross and the resurrection. Then fifthly at Pentecost there is once more a triadic structure. The spirit that proceeds from the Father is sent down upon the church by the Son. So again, we've got the pattern, Spirit, Father, Son. Pentecost is different from the Annunciation, but complements and balances it. At the Annunciation, the Spirit sends Christ into the world, the Spirit that proceeds from the Father. At Pentecost, Christ, sends the Spirit into the world. So the Annunciation, the Spirit sends Christ, and at Pentecost, 
Christ sends the Spirit. Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, writing at the end of the second century, speaks of the Son and the Spirit as the two hands of God. And so we see in the five moments of salvation history that are standing out in the New Testament, how God is always using both his hands together. So there is a threefold thread running right through the New Testament. Then, thirdly, let's think about the worshipping life of the church. Everywhere in the prayer of the church, the Lex Orandi, the law of prayer, we encounter the three, the holy three. From its earliest beginnings, Christian prayer was marked by triadic formulae. It's no coincidence that the three clearest references to the Trinity in the Bible all occur within the context of prayer and worship. The first comes at the end of the Gospel of St. Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 19, when the risen Christ instructs his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That is an absolutely decisive moment in the New Testament. The command of the risen Christ to his disciples, what they are to do in the world after he has gone. They are to baptize, but not just to baptize in the name of God the Father, not just to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, but they are to baptize in the name of the three, Father, Son, and Spirit. There, at the very foundation of the church, we have the Trinity. But then there are two other places in the New Testament where the threefold nature of God is expressed in the form of a blessing.